Welcome to the final episode for Series 52, everyone. We've got some great discussion happening this episode and some phenomenal fanfics spread throughout. Before we get there, though, we have some announcements for what is coming up in our call to action. The Alchemistress's Kickstarter is wrapping up near the end of the month, so check that out if you haven't yet. It's a mm -hmm. great game that we're very excited about, and they have some awesome stretch goals, so I'd love to see them reach those. Absolutely. Uh, and of course, we will have our usual patron shoutouts, uh, what is coming up in the next few weeks for this show, and some outtakes at the very end of the episode. Until then, please enjoy the show. our discussion episode. Last time, we finished our session zero for Under the Neighborhood. This episode, we will be discussing the character creation process. We are thrilled to welcome back Kyle Decker. Do you want to reintroduce yourself for everyone and tell us a little bit about the wonderful character that you made? Hi, my name is Kyle, he, him, and I will be playing Aaron Caldwell, the non trainer who stumbles into success. Also, he, him. That's how we introduce every episode. I, I couldn't help but do it. Well, I mean, uh, it makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah, I, I am Kyle. I am the designer of Under the Neighborhood and host of the Under the Neighborhood podcast, Quest Friends. I made a character named Aaron Caldwell, the non trainer who stumbles into success, and I was supposed to do, I'm supposed to do a brief, like, summary of of what his deal is right yes please tell us okay. about johnny gator <laughs> johnny gator i don't know who plays johnny gator we got to figure that out is that is that what johnny gator sounds like <laughs> like you well, know the pokemon always say their names that's up for one of you two to decide oh, i yeah. don't get to i don't get to i don't get to embody See, yeah, he johnny, would be johnny gator. gator johnny gator Johnny Amelia gator. gets to play Johnny Gator. He's it's Johnny decided. Gator. <laughs> um, <laughs> Every move. But no, Johnny Aaron gator. Caldwell is a pretty average guy. He is a high school junior, a uh, guy with a football player physique, but he prefers to do the drums. And, you know, he just lives in a nice Midwest town called Hartford, who loves their late Valentine's Day parade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, also, he he owns a magical sky gator called Johnny Gator because he <laughs> lives in a world where small towns have other small towns living in the sky above them. <laughs> and he, as the Mon Trainer, has decided that he is going to befriend all the magical sky critters that come from these uh, these sky civilizations. He only has one right now, Johnny Gator, a ferocious sky gator who has the powers of the swamp. Nice. Oh, and he hovers just a little bit off the ground when he walks. Oh, yeah. I can't believe I forgot the important that detail. Details. Thank you. <laughs> he's, he's fierce, but he has he has little legs that he has to swim through the water. So he looks real cute. Mm -hmm. I love him. I love him. <laughs> My character doesn't, but we'll get to that. Uh, Ryan, tell us about your character. Yeah, so uh, my character is Daisy Thunder, the magical girl who casts spells, she, her pronouns. Uh, Daisy is a college freshman uh, going to uh, college with a uh, roller derby scholarship um she's got the appearance of a sky roller derby hopeful um and uh came from sky hertford and transferred down here uh probably mid high school or so or maybe early high school to to become part of the high school roller derby team because that's the only way you get scouted to the the college league yeah, yeah. so hartford you know, heartthrobs the Hartford heartthrobs. The, the Hartford heartthrobs. You forgot Absolutely. A name from that. <laughs> uh, and her desire is to become the roller derby champion. Um, and uh, she also has a an animal companion, but this one is a magical animal companion. And those that are in the know 
will be able to know that she's able to communicate with uh, this magical companion. Um, and the companion is a sky blue sky fox named Azura. Oh, very good. Yes. I love it. Um, and one of the other things is uh, I get a magical item, and my magical item I've decided is an ankle bracelet. And Ooh. the ankle bracelet oh. is a magical bracelet that, le- that lets me defy gravity. Oh, that's right. I so you can really roll it on like the ceiling. That. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I love it. <laughs> and Amelia, how about your character? Uh, my character is named Novella Bane. I picked the Divided playbook. So I have the Divided who was lost in the other. Um, I have a otherworldly patron that has granted me some magical abilities and probably like doesn't want anything from me or anything. Uh, no, there's like no corruption <laughs> happening or anything. You what? just didn't pay attention to that part of the orientation. Oh, no, I, just, I, yeah. I just figured out if I was GM who, what the patron would be. <laughs> oh, we'll get to that in our fanfic yeah. section. You can tell us. Yeah, yeah, I figured it out. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I have the skills um, understanding the other, and then I have an inability to interact with creatures. So I am terrified of Johnny Gator. I do not like him. We're not friends. Yeah, um, Azura I, too a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah, but yeah, at mostly. least you can talk to her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, like she's like more magical, you know. I don't know. Yeah, she just seems like cuter. I transferred to Hartford from Sky Hartford. Um, my dad got a new job, and so now we had to move down here to the ground Hartford. It's not as nice. <laughs> I my appearance is vaguely spooky. And I just really want to be the smartest person in the room. (laughs) I love it. Uh, Well, let's go ahead and dive right into a segment we are calling D20 for your thoughts. D20 for your thoughts. So in this segment, we talk to our guests about their thoughts on character creation, um, the process and how it relates to this system and other games. First, we get to ask the most cliche question of all RPG podcasts ever. How'd you get into gaming? Web comics. Interesting. Interesting. Discuss. So I, <laughs> a friend of mine in college was like, hey, there's this web comic called Darth's and Droids. Mm. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. It's, yep, yep, I don't yep. know where, I think they're at one of the sequel trilogies now because they're still going. But <laughs> what it was is it took the idea that the Star Wars prequel trilogy was made by a bunch of people doing a role playing game. Oh, okay. So they take a bunch of stills from say the Phantom Menace and then they put out of character and in character dialogue on it. Amazing. Oh, wow. And so you've got different people like R2D2 is the power gamer who like, you know, takes the 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 short stat and all these other presumably things that like don't aren't actually bad, yeah. but mechanically let him take things like I have rockets. And uh, <laughs> the character who plays Anakin Skywalker is the one who's really into the drama of it all. Oh my God, that makes so much sense. <laughs> so it's, it was really, it, it's a, it was a really fun webcomic, at least back when I, I read it. I, I can't say whether or not it's good now. Cause it's one of those things that I just stopped reading it. It's not that it got bad. I just, moved on to other stuff became an adult and yeah yeah so i was i had this kind of idea seeing it from uh, a perspective where i didn't see really see the roles or anything i just saw this fun dynamic of the out of character in character stuff Mm -hmm. and i thought i really wanted to try this so one of my friends said let's play a game and i thought yeah i'm sure any game we pick will work well for me and then i played pathfinder (laughs) oh buddy (laughs) And Pathfinder is not a bad game by any means, but it is a game for a very specific type of player. And that is the opposite of whatever I am. (laughs) So I played that for I played that presumed that it just wasn't for me uh, left. I ended up getting into another Pathfinder campaign. I don't know how. uh, And then I really thought it will be different. (laughs) (laughs) And then I really fell in love when uh, one of my friends ran a cipher system game called The Strange. Mm. Mm-hmm. 
And so, and that's why I pull so much from Cypher System, because that was the mechanics that got me into the game. Because while, you know, it's not necessarily as pushing towards narrative as other things, it allowed for a flexibility that I really liked. And it's also a game where you can get cosmic powers relatively easily. And that's also very fun. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And, and I also just, I like the, I like the kind of weird sci-fi aesthetic more than fantasy. Mm-hmm. Obviously, Under the Neighborhood can do both, but my preference leans towards towards that. So, yeah, I yeah. did The Strange, and it was a grand old time. Very cool. So, so what do you look for in a system as far as character creation goes? Like, what sort of pieces need to be there for great characters to happen? I think it really depends on the game. I think a game needs one of two things, and they're the exact opposite things. Oh. oh. I think one thing a game needs, if it really... A game needs to either, A encourage a lot of diversity and choices or B, give you something very strict. Mm. And the idea behind that is that in a game like Under the Neighborhood, which is designed to be more flexible, I think it's very important to not necessarily give your characters options to be stronger, but give them things to make them really unique and specific. Tabletop games are role playing games for sure, But they are also OC generators. Mm, And mm -hmm. so you want to be able to. And that's one of the things I loved about Cypher System is that you had your generic types, your classes. Mm -hmm. But you had this hyper specific thing of like, I can speak to machines or I uh, I can spread off my soul someplace else. And I have that like descriptive sentence at the beginning that you do. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's important for me to to have those options, not necessarily for mechanical benefits, but just so someone can be like, I'm doing something really unique. Um, And then the other option I think that they really need or is something that is either absent because character mechanics aren't important to the game or something that is extremely directed. Uh, And that's it because some games have a very specific thing that they have in mind And uh, so an example I can think of is a game I love called Mission Accomplished, Mm. where Mm -hmm. you are super spies in in an office meeting. And literally the only thing for character creation is you are a spy. You are a silly spy. No mechanics. And I think for that game, the very basic here is a thing you have to be, but we're not giving you anything else helps for that because it really focuses you on this idea of I'm just in an office meeting and I'm just a spy. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do any other really special stuff on top of that. Um, So, yeah, I think a good game system should really focus for me, at least should focus on one of the two. And then the other thing that's important for me is readability. I feel like I should be able to read from top to bottom and know exactly what I need to put in. I love that. Yeah, I I strongly agree with that last point, especially there's some times where I just am like, just give me the information that I need. Like, don't put all of this other stuff in here. I was actually talking with people about that last night because they were like, oh, this book has like all of these examples and these little panels in here. And I was like, no, because like, just give me the information that I need up front. You can give me all that other stuff later, but like, don't make me read through that to find what I need. Yeah. And that's why like even today when we made characters, I noticed that all of us accidentally skip skills, which I'd put at the end. So I made a note for myself that, hey, if I ever change this game in the future, I need to make sure that if I'm just reading from top to bottom, I don't just assume, oh, well, I did my moves. I don't need to read down any further. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because when you get to moves, that's going to be a section that any player is going to think, well, I don't have to read every word. And Mm -hmm. yeah, you probably shouldn't have to read every word. (laughs) Yep, absolutely. Um, you, you said mission accomplished and, and my brain went to the game that I played for IPM where I, I somehow still made a magical girl. Ryan, <laughs> of course you did. Magical girl, super spy. In Ryan's defense, I also made a cowboy adjacent character. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, and I did it again with Johnny Gator. Uh-huh. <laughs> How 
do you think that character creation in Under the Neighborhood stacks up against some of those other systems that you've played? I'd like to say very good, but of course that's because I made it. Right. Uh, (laughs) I think it varies. I definitely, it definitely does a lot of the things I really like. And since doing early playtesting, it seems like I haven't had a lot of confusion compared to other things. Most people have come in, although there have been downsides before, like when someone has chosen a descriptor and a move that were basically the same thing because nothing in the book warned them and said, hey, some descriptors are basically just playbook moves, but made bigger. Yeah. Um. So I definitely think it for the most part, is going to have that readability. It's going to have the information you need. And uh, one thing that was really important to me is that that I think some of the other systems I played doesn't don't have is really that encouragement to go back and make adjustments and continually refine those characters. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's one thing I think it stacks up pretty well. One thing that I do think you're going to find more challenging than another powered by the apocalypse game that uses playbooks or cipher system is that cipher system has its three pronged setup mm-hmm. you have your descriptor, your type and focus. And that's it. You just choose it. You read it, your things and you enter it. And powered by the apocalypse games have you pick your playbook and you pick your moves. And then you circle. Un- stuff. Yep. Yeah. Under the neighborhood has both. Yeah. Which I think brings in both of their benefits, but it also brings in some of the additional complexity of both of them. Mm -hmm. And that is one thing that how could I change it? I don't know. I would have written it differently if I did, but uh, that is one thing that I think um, isn't necessarily worse, but something that I think is a bit more complicated than, than the other ones because it's pulling from both schools. So again, it's going to have the benefits of both, but it will have some of the complexity of both as well. I mean, it, it makes it stand out a bit too, because like I I can see the like the PBTA roots that are like in the bones of the characters in this game, like the the playbooks and all that sort of stuff and the moves. And even the descriptor gives you the the PBTA style moves kind of associated with it in, in most cases. Um and then you've got the the cipher system influences as well like um the the descriptor the um and then you got skills and and inabilities and stuff like that that are going to be modifying things and you don't see those much in pbta games especially since pbta is more like focused on getting those moves and not so much on how skills influence that yeah Mm -hmm. and so i think that's really cool Skills are one thing I think are work really well in a powered by the apocalypse context, because the way they work in cipher system is similar to how it is here, where it is just a thing you pick. You just say, I'm good at I'm good at uh, what was it? I had one of my characters be good at esports. Mm-hmm. And we in do a love lot esports of, here. <laughs> and a lot of systems that cipher system is closer to things like D&D and Pathfinder, you don't you have to choose from a very specific list. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the flexibility of just pick something that sounds nice is something that can be challenging, but something I think works well with Powered by the Apocalypse if you have a more loosey-goosey Powered by the Apocalypse, Mm -hmm. that is. Yeah, well, I think one thing that we talked about with PBTA, Ryan, when we we covered... Chimera, actually, um, that Amr brought up is that PBTA especially tends to be very specific. Like, this PBTA game is for this genre and does this niche thing. Yeah. And so, because of that, in those spaces where the game leaves it pretty open and is like, pick a thing, you're already within such a narrow window just by choosing that particular game that it doesn't feel as overwhelming to just have this blank spot. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, no, I, I love it. I, I love uh, that the the moves are very unique for the playbooks mm-hmm. and that you, you get a decent amount off the bat that that it really defines your character um, between those moves and the descriptor um, and, and especially your skills. Like I 
if I didn't see roller blading as a skill in there for the magical girl, I wouldn't have come up with my my roller derby hopeful uh, Daisy, you know, and and that's amazing. I love it. Yeah. So how does the process of character creation reinforce the feel of this game and set expectations for play? I'd like to throw this question back mm-hmm. because I've clearly set up what, because even if you haven't played this game, I've stated, you know, here's the goals of the game. Here's the kind of thing you're wanting to play. I'm, I know what my intention was, but I'm curious as folks who played it without having made it, what kind of expectations you have for your characters. For me, I think it's really obvious that this like magical and mundane are going to be interacting because there are lots of things Mm. about my character, you know, like those relationships and, you know, just like the basics about like, what is your appearance? Where are you from? What do you want? That are just really basic, like, tell me about your person kind of questions. (laughs) Um, But then when you get to those moves and... You know, not even necessarily the skills, because in some of some of the cases, the skills are really just like regular people things, you know, like interacting with creatures is, you know, one of my inabilities, like I'm just like not good at animals. Yeah. You know, I think it really makes it obvious that you are going to be mixing those things because all of my moves are very heavily centered on that magic portion of what I do. Mm -hmm. But everything else is like, tell me about where you hang out, you know, like. (laughs) Yeah. Who who are your friends? Do you like Johnny Gator? Um, so I, I think I'm, it, it does a really good job. And especially having come off of that setting creation that we all did together. Um, it's very clear that this game is about the interaction of those things and that both parts of it are important. That it's not just like you started out normal and now you're not. Uh, yeah. But that like going back and forth is going to matter. Yeah. And I, I'm feeling like... Uh, you're going to have a lot of control as a player over what ends up in the world as well. Um, yeah. The, like most games that have collaborative world building, that's that's kind of a general feel, but like it feels like a little bit extra here, which is nice. Um, and especially when you uh, were describing kind of how the the mundane intrusion things happen. Where where it's just like oh something my coffee maker's broken right yeah. or or my roller blades are uh, need tune ups <laughs> or something like that no I'm right s- <laughs> 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 that's a normal mundane thing my roller blades are haunted um and uh, and I can see that that adds to the world building even more the the creative control that players will have uh, throughout play uh, which which sounds really great. Yeah, that's that's pretty much that's pretty much my thoughts as well. Um, I the only other thing I can I can say is especially having done it now, because in hereafter, we already knew our relationships before we set those compatibility scores is I feel like those compatibility scores help set up dynamics very early on. Yeah, even if. Again, they're only used in one move in in the game. They're used for if you're going to help somebody else. Mm. But I think having them there is still helpful to just like get a beat. And I yeah, it sets some yeah. role play expectations right off the bat. Absolutely, and I love that it's two way though too. Um, yeah, yeah, I like that too. Uh, because like I could I could easily see like the person that's got plus two uh, compatibility with somebody else, and that person's got a minus two. Like, I'm just so annoyed <laughs> by this person. Mm-hmm. This person's like, I will follow you to the ends of the earth. You are the greatest thing, uh, the the greatest person I've ever met. And goodness oh, gracious. so awkward. Yeah, it would just be so <laughs> awkward, right? Me. Absolutely. <laughs> it's like the, the eternal groupie. Still thinking about how I stole, not stole, but how my biggest inspiration for those mechanics was Metopia of all things. What is that? Metopia is a role playing game, uh, just a cute little basic role playing game where you take your Mii's on the switch and they go on little adventures. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Together. And uh, but one of the things that I mentioned is that if you get in a very big fight, you can temporarily switch your compatibility score to negative one 
until that's healed. And that's a that's a mechanic in Miitopia. Your Mies can get mad at each other and Ugh. get a negative score where they will actively undermine each other. That's so until, good. Until they repair their friendship and then it goes back to whatever it was at previously. Oh, that's lovely. Oh, that's amazing. I love that. Yeah. I fought with my fiance a lot. The me versions of me and my fiance <laughs> fought a surprising amount. Uh, yeah, because that's how you handle things in a relationship is, you know, like uh, I at one point, my ex-husband set a rule that we were only allowed to play Mario Party on cooperative mode because I couldn't be trusted <laughs> to do it on competitive <laughs> mode. <laughs> said that wasn't good for our marriage. Oh, <laughs> oh! it's just no playing with me and my fiance because yeah. I get too impatient, oh, even yeah. especially in co-op. I yeah. am hyper competitive when it comes to Mario Party. Well, uh, like, how can you not be? I like, mean, like extra hyper the competitive. The stakes are high. And the, ruthless. I am ruthless and hyper competitive. I can't imagine Party. you being ruthless at anything. <laughs> it, <laughs> let's play Does Mario Party. bring out your someday. dark side. Mario Party brings out your dark side. Yep. Brings out your inner dirge <laughs> stranglethorn. Each, uh -huh. each year, uh, the Quest Friends cast, meet, we meet up every year. And there's a little Burger King ladybug from Miraculous Ladybug uh, that's a trophy. Oh and we gosh. play a Mario Party game or a game like Mario Party and we play it once and the winner gets to keep oh. the trophy. And I have not once won and I am livid about it. <laughs> Brian, let's do this. Let's we, we'll, do this. We'll have to play some Mario Party sometime okay. and record it for <laughs> we could prosperity. Stream it. Yeah. We could stream it. Oh, that would be fun. That would be amazing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> one thing that we like to talk about is the design of character sheets um, and what that kind of tells us about the game and about what things are important um, in a game. So can you talk a little bit about why the character sheets look the way they look or were there certain things that you felt it was really important to have on there or to not have on there? Yeah. So the character she's in Under the Neighborhood, like a lot of the design is extremely functional. Mm -hmm. I don't have graphic design experience, but in my experience, a lot of really good looking things are very simple. So as long as you can focus on the simple core important parts, you can make it work. So with Under the Neighborhood, I tried to prioritize things in three categories. There were the immutable things about your character that were extremely important, and I put those at the very top, followed by the things that were going to be often changeable and often referenced, which are in the middle, and then the second page is all basically stuff for specific characters. Mm -hmm. So on the character sheet, we start with character name, the playbook who descriptor. For me, it's very important that you have who your character is and you have their thing because their playbook is their specific thing. Their descriptor is their specific thing. These are two things your character, even though they're, you know, a average person in this world, they're still this is their thing among the group and among mm -hmm. the characters and players in the story. After that, I have pronouns, age, appearance, home world, want. I have those up very high as well as as well, because these are the things that you have decided early on. And some of them might change, but these are things I want to be able to be readily accessible. Mm -hmm. After that, things I prioritized were things like stats, adventure points, signature items, moves. These are the things that you're going to be referencing all the time while you play. It was especially important for me to have adventure points have a big section in it because they are a very critical resource. Mm -hmm. You know, as Ryan mentioned, one of his moves is requires AP. And for Amelia, well... You chose corruption instead of <laughs> AP, yeah. but that's how that playbook works. That playbook basically swaps out corruption for AP. And if I had taken a move from it or Ryan had, we actually would have done AP instead of corruption. Mm -hmm. mm. So it was important to me that was top. The one thing that is a bit interesting on the first page that doesn't super high is actually our arc move which is as you play, eventually you take on a character flaw hmm. and you think of what is my big character arc? And then in a moment of overall change, 
you're able to get a new, very powerful move that relates to the growth your character has had. Mm. And so I have it on the first page because it's important, but it is kind of hidden because many players will jump to that sooner than they should. Like, I recommend you playing for like a couple of months before you even start thinking about an overall flaw. So I have it there because it is very important to a character, but I only want people looking at it once they've really gotten used to the sheet and gotten mm. used to the character okay. and are fine with it being down. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, second page is pretty much all the supplementary stuff. I mean, you've got important things like bio, notes, compatibility scores, and a lot of the stuff on the second page will be core to characters, like my information about my mom, or uh, advancements, or meters, which is where Amelia's corruption meter would have gone for all of the corruption points. Mm -hmm. But because it was so specific to character, I thought, let's put it on the second page so that it's there, but that it's not taking up space for characters who wouldn't use it. Perfect. I think, I mean, I think that it was really easy to use. One thing that I always look at um, on a character sheet is how easy was it for me to tell where things go? Mm -hmm. When we make those choices in character creation, how easy is it for me to translate and say, this is the spot for that on my sheet? Um, and this one especially, it was it was very clear because it was so like streamlined and clean that it was like, I don't have to look around and kind of try to figure out what goes in what box. It was like, this is named the thing. The box has a name on it. I put it in the box, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, oh, that was one random thing I forgot. You can add this in or you can cut it. One thing I, I realized I completely spaced on is the fact that a Powered by the Apocalypse game has a character sheet to begin with and not just a playbook. Yeah. And I think that mm -hmm. kind of showcases how flexibility and customization is so important to me. Mm -hmm. It yeah. also highlights a more minor annoyance in that Powered by the Apocalypse games often have you taking moves from other playbooks. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, well, now I have yeah, multiple no character this, sheets and, and there's yeah. no spot. What's going on? Uh -huh. Which is the nature of how things go. Like I have less spots for playbook and descriptor moves here than you will actually get over the course of the game. But there was no way to f make this work without putting in too many too few slots oh yeah so i know some of it is just functionally how it works as well but mm -hmm. yeah it's not bad and then you've got the electronic version of the sheet too with that where i could just add as many playbook and descriptor moves as i want in there and the scroll bar will just keep growing right yeah so i, I think that really works well um and then the and and yeah when we go to the actual character sheet itself it's all all right there yeah and i can and see I've been, that that advancement uh is uh something i want to talk about but we gotta wait for that segment <laughs> yeah we'll get there yeah <laughs> and then roll 20 sheets which might be out by the time this is released my friend scott casey has been working on them uh, he does a lot of roll 20 sheets built very similarly they are on the surface very simple but you can dig in and make them very in depth if you want them oh to. very nice very cool. One of my favorite questions to ask uh, designers of the games that we're covering, uh, what do you think is one of the biggest flaws of character creation in this system? And what do you think is one of the best parts? Well, let me do the interview answer and have them be the same. Ooh. <laughs> but we kind of addressed on this when we did character creation and Ryan got to cast spells and it was a full page long for descriptor. Uh -huh. Whereas other descriptors are a paragraph at most. Yeah. The system is really designed around customizability above anything else. It's designed. I want your characters to be regular people. Although again, with customizability, they can get pretty strong, but the goal is to have <coughs> Characters who have a wide spread of options so that you can make someone who is unique and fully your own creation. Mm -hmm. And I also really wanted a game where mechanically you could vary from having a playbook that is 
you can vary from having a character who's very easy to understand with very simple things. One of our descriptors plays sports, doesn't even have a move. It just gives you more skills mm. up to the point where you can have the divided, which gets an extra move and has an old, its own separate meter or the weird, which has an additional stat. And then mm. you could throw, you know, harnesses incredible power which has you make like five different choices oh. just for that specific <laughs> descriptor and so i think that is a really big benefit of the game is that you can you can turn it into a bunch of little micro games mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. and i think that allows for a lot of flexibility and a lot of fun and it makes it so that someone new can come and make something simple but someone who really wants to play can have a lot of fun playing with the sheets that does come at some cost though it does come at a cost of it, it mostly balance balance and confusion so there are going to be points where you're going to have questions and you're not sure what a ruling is do i roll for this do i not because i wanted to leave that up to when you played with the gm mm -hmm. and you discussing with them you know should we roll for this should we not um and there's also the fact that balance is out the window. I say that this is a game about ordinary people, and I really want it to be. But you could break it very easily if you <laughs> wanted to. Like, you could... Like, let, let's use this as an example. And I think, uh, Ryan, you made a fantastic character, but Ryan made a magical girl who casts spells which is a very not mundane thing. No. Right. Whereas I made someone like Aaron, who was meant to be an extremely mundane character. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things that it's not necessarily, it's going to be a flaw for some people and not for others. Uh, but I think that's a thing to keep in mind in my quest for customizability above all else. You could accidentally stumble into some confusion and you're not going to be balanced. No. Yeah. Like that's out the window. That's a non, that's a non factor, <laughs> but I've tried and I cannot guarantee anything. <laughs> well, the, the fun okay. thing about, yeah, the fun thing about PBTA though, is it doesn't have to be balanced, right? Yeah. Um, since a, a lot of, uh, PBTA games, it's, it's all narrative. Like, yeah. you're, you're going to be like, well, I'm going to do this cool thing. Well, you roll this, roll this move with this stat and everybody's got that sort of thing. And here's the extra flavor you throw on there. That's great. Absolutely. Uh, maybe, maybe my, all my bells and whistles give me more advantages, but so what? Right. Uh, the interesting stuff comes in the partial successes and the failures. So uh, honestly, who's more balanced uh, towards advancing the story? OK, that that's fair. I think I've been haunted since a session I ran a while ago, which is the best again, kind of sticking with this, the best and worst moment we ever had. Uh, I won't go in details in case anyone who listens to Quest Friends listens to this because it will happen on the show. But there was one moment where a character has a move where essentially when he lies, he can spend an AP to make that lie a truth. Ooh. Right. And. Typically, I expect it for things like, yes, there's supposed to be. Yes, I am the safety inspector. Yep. Use one AP and someone's like, ah, yes, the safety inspector was supposed to come in today. A character, a player without realizing it said, oh, yeah, this person is the mastermind and rolls one AP. And I'm like, oh, well, I guess this is the mastermind now. <laughs> and. <laughs> In order to make that work, because they didn't just choose a ran, they chose the worst person. So like the rules of the universe just snapped over this one moves leg, a very basic move, too. And yeah, we have a new character now uh, and it's great and it's brilliant. And it's one of my favorite moments on the show. But I live in fear now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a, there's a lot of implications for that. Yeah. Especially because, as I said, the player was acting in good faith. Like. Yeah. She didn't realize until the look of fear went on my face what she had done. <laughs> Play to find out. Yeah. yeah. 
That, yeah. that, that's one of the things I love about GMing Powered by the Apocalypse is that complete unknown of the future. <laughs> like, you could have, like, even more than, like, D&D and the, the players messing up your plans by doing something, you know, completely different than you expected. Like, PBTA is like... If if they could make the rolls the right way and and do the right things and use the right moves, like there's nothing you can do about that. <laughs> yep. Yeah. You just gotta roll with it. That is so good though. <laughs> All right, Ryan, it's the question you've been waiting for. <gasps> We're gonna discuss our stories. This is what we refer to as the fanfic portion of the show. Yes, please. Um how how do we think this goes? How do we how do we? You had something specific you wanted to talk about, right? Well, I had an I- idea for a patron. Oh do yes, we want yes, to yes. Do please. Overall, pl- all right. So, of course, we don't have to to go this way, uh, especially because uh, with someone like the divided, I probably, I know I as a GM would probably ask, do you have any ideas before you start? Mm-hmm. Uh, because when we had a divided with Misha in uh, our first season of Quest Friends. The character did not, the player did not know they were the divided, so I had more freedom as GM to kind of do things. Yeah. But here, here's my pitch for um, Amelia's patron. Not, not, not Amelia, sorry. Uh, Novella, I, I just, yeah. For Novella's patron, Florida Man. Uh, <laughs> yes, that is correct. <laughs> Not oh, a Florida no. man. Just, just Florida man. Florida man. The, oh, the being man. of pure chaos. Yeah. Oh, that's and so good. The antithesis to everything Novella wants to be. Right. Like Novella wants to be, uh, you know, this kind of uh, this very intelligent, thoughtful, bookish person. And you just have a chaos. Right. Yeah. That's, chaos oh, man. That's perfect. That's so good. That's so good. Oh, that's wild. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm all for that. (laughs) So then the question is like, what kind of what kind of stuff does Florida Man want from you? You know, like what is like, is it just to create chaos? What is what does Florida Man want? Yeah, it's it's tough because it could. I'm trying to figure out what the relationship would be. You know, was it by chance or did you take a trip to Florida? Hold on, I have a. I think I have a book for that. <laughs> <laughs> Everything you want to know about Florida Man and more. <laughs> the notorious cryptid known as Florida Man has been seen multiple occasions within the headlines of I'm most gonna, nationwide I'm, news. Cryptid kids suggestion. Uh, my friend Hallie uh runs a spinoff series. Uh, each each campaign of quest friends Mm. so the previous one was called uh cookie crew but this one is called cryptid kids and there are two off-limit cryptids because i have them as main antagonists in the main series Mm -hmm. but other than that all of the players are cryptids we've got bert the mothman we've got the jersey devil we've (sighs) got a grim reaper in training and we've got tommy Wiseau. oh amazing but he just goes by johnny so I'm going to suggest Florida Man as an NPC. Oh, there All you right. go. Uh, let's see here. Where are the... I'm dying to know what this book is. I know, right? Is. It, is, um, it is a Troika supplement um, from Exalted Funeral. It is called Cocaine and Alligator Man. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it just Cocaine has like a bunch of different Florida style, like Florida Man. Man headline kind of characters. But there's one... I imagine every time, every time, because with the the divided as the divided uh, corruption meter fills, it isn't the corruption meter fills and you have a confrontation. It's basically every time the corruption meter fills, things get worse and worse in the sense that the patron is coming increases. So maybe the patron, you get like a hard move. So maybe the patron asks for like, you need to do this for me. Or, you know, if they're broken, maybe one of the locks of their cell breaks. Yeah. And then as things go on, uh, eventually it'll lead to a big confrontation. Mm -hmm. Uh, But all I could think of with alligators and cocaine man is just every time the meter fills, Florida man just gets a new adjective added to the front (gasps) of his name. That's (laughs) amazing. 
Um, I like Harry this, Florida Man. Yeah, this one Big does Harry have Florida Man. Uh, D six actual Florida Man headlines and D one drugs at this party. The one is all of them. So um, yeah, and then it's just got a bunch of different um, weird Florida. I like alligator with sunglasses. Um, oh, it's so good. Biting four, partying three, surfing one, driving two. Uh, it's just, it's just, it's messy, um, and I love it. But All I'm right. just trying to see if there's anything in here that was like, I thought there was another random table in here about like what Florida man is up to. But anyway, um, I like that I had a book for that. Uh, yeah, I think I think adding an adjective every time would be amazing. Oh, that's so good. Is there like a critical mass of adjectives that we have to be on? Well, the I mean, for? I think that that's like when we you kind of like keep track of that corruption track, right? Yeah. That like, yeah. you know, as it as it steadily goes up. Um, do I start becoming more chaotic and more Florida? Does 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 Florida man want you to become Florida man? Right. Oh, no. Yeah. Flo- Florida man wants to pass the mantle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh no. Flor- it's the only way he can break out of Florida. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Get out of the limelight for a little bit. Mm-hmm. But that would far future. That would be an interesting way to link Aaron into the into the story, because Aaron, let's say, just found uh, what the heck did, found just found Johnny Gator someday. But Johnny Gator actually first appeared when one of the rifts from Florida opened up. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so good. You may have given me my best friend, but you've hurt my other best friend. <laughs> <laughs> He screamed. Oh, Everybody so is Aaron's best friend. It's true. Mm-hmm. But but Johnny Gator more than everyone else. Socks. Absolutely. I'm eating socks. Okay. Just trying to eat the socks. Oh no. <laughs> Always. So that's that's my pitch. Florida man as the patron and a major antagonist. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, yeah. That makes perfect sense. <laughs> and who loves roller derby more than Florida man? Uh-oh. No one. No one. No one. That's who. Because <laughs> of the chaos and the pure like uh antagonism. <laughs> oh, and, and the drama too. Yeah, well, yeah, for sure. Gosh, you can't you can't go without the drama. Mm-hmm. The yes, the glory and drama of roller derby. Uh-huh. Absolutely. <laughs> well, um, let's go ahead and get into our advancement segment uh and take it up a level. Take it up a level. Take it up a level. So this segment we use to talk about character advancement and character growth in this game. So let's start by asking, how does a character, quote unquote, level up in Under the Neighborhood? And how do characters get to change mechanically when that happens? All right. So Under the Neighborhood uses milestone advancement. Essentially, what this means is every set number of adventures, you get to pick a perk. I have a couple of recommendations. So some systems are you get one advancement at the end of each adventure or every four adventures, you get two advancements or you get four advancements every time uh, an arc or a series of adventures that tell an overarching story like a season of a TV show. end. Mm -hmm. the reason for that is one, I'm not a fan of tracking XP. It's just personally not. Yeah. One of my favorite things. And then the other one is it helps you really adjust advancement for how long you expect your game to last. Uh, and you can very easily just adjust that on the fly if you realize, oh, we need to slow down advancement. Uh, the way characters advance is we have three different types of advancements that you can get. We have basic advancements, super advancements and ultra advancements. Basic advancements are available early on. They're going to be things that are either very small benefits to you or very lateral gains. Like you don't really gain something new. You don't really gain something more powerful. You just gain something new. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The idea is that early on, I want to let people spread out, choose more fun options, especially knowing that lots of campaigns don't make it past this early stage. Yeah. And also because... I keep talking about the mundanity of the characters in the world, and I wanted early on to keep that. Now, in many shows, like we referenced an episode called Weird Mageddon, which you can kind of guess is pretty (laughs) weird. As shows go on, 
characters get more powerful, things get more weird, story arcs get bigger, and that slice of life stuff while there often takes more of a back seat. So as you advance on, I'm much more like, yeah, get super strong. But early on, kind of keeping that, you get to try some more things. So you can increase a stat, mm. add a new item, choose a new move. Uh, super advancements you get after undergoing four other advancements, which, as I said, I recommend doing after like what would be a season of a TV show's mm -hmm. worth of time. These are going to be where you get to do really neat things or you get to advance your skills. So you can increase the number of AP that you have between sessions because there's a cap. You can start upgrading your moves and descriptors to advanced versions that are more powerful. And you can even add a second additional descriptor. Oh, so, that's cool. Yeah, it makes it. And it, it's one of those things that I think it would be really neat. But again, is kept for later on because... By the time you get there, even though there isn't space on the character sheet for a second descriptor, you're used enough to the character sheets that you'll be able to add another one yeah. to that and your summary, no problem. Mm -hmm. And then finally, ultra advancements. Ultra advancements are for people who are, you're there, you've taken eight other advancements, you're two seasons in, you're going <laughs> the distance. Mm -hmm. uh, this one, you can start increasing stats to a max of plus four. Wow. You can start increasing the stat called the weird stat, which is normally exclusive to a playbook, but it actually does have a specific move related to the other. So it basically says you can interact with this otherworldly space. No one else can. You know, we can finally understand Florida man when we take these advancements. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. And then there's some basic upgrade everything else to advance because I like having that option. Yeah. One other notable form of advancement, though, is what we call arc moves. So arc moves. So once you're a handful of sessions in, I recommend like a season worth of a TV show or half of a season. Once you've really got a handle on your characters, I encourage everyone to pick a flaw. You know, like uh, Aaron is... Uh, Aaron maybe loves everyone, but he doesn't actually make super close connections. And that's his character flaw. And I just realized during play that Aaron was kind of flaky, like he was a nice guy, but eh. and essentially what happens is at moments of big character growth. So uh, either positive or negative. So when Aaron makes a genuine connection or maybe Aaron abandons the team in a moment of need because he can't get close or. You know, a moment where Daisy says, I'm no longer roller derbying or Novella yeah. succumbs. Novella fights Florida man and succumbs, becomes Florida oh, no. man. No, you essentially get to grab an arc move. I encourage players and GMs to make their own arc moves because arc moves are meant to be busted. They are meant to be absolutely destroy the game but as a result cost multiple ap to spend mm. uh and the idea is that this is your definitive thing you can't use it typically but in the moments where you can use it you're gonna you're gonna be a powerhouse mm -hmm. like an example could be mon fusion which costs one ap so if aaron's arc related to him connecting to to johnny gator maybe in a moment where the two really become one I get this arc move that lets me fuse literally with Johnny Gator or uh, my own future. Someone who is def literally defies fate can spend two AP to undo a scene and say that was just what fate said it was. And now we're going to play it again for <laughs> real or something like that. You only get one arc move and you get it whenever that moment happens. And if you have a new uh, if you have a new advancement, if, say, Novella, after becoming the Florida man, overcomes and sheds that identity and, and regains herself, then uh, the Florida man, then the Florida man arc move, whatever that would be, will switch to a different arc move. Mm. So unlike advancements, which are very milestone based, these are very story based, it's essentially when you hit a point and you'll often know a session or two ahead of time that like, all right, we're kind of building up to something big. Mm -hmm. You and the GM will either take from my list of options or create your own 
very, very strong move that lets you yeah. showcase who you've become. That's I love amazing. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I don't want to become Florida man, though. No. <laughs> we got to stop that. That's so scary. That's we got to be we got to be ready. I should have seen all this corruption. <laughs> Well, by that time, I'll have uh, at least one girlfriend on the roller derby team um, <laughs> right. and, and, and sure. an entourage uh, to bring up because uh, like some of the advancement is like there's you can take the extra moves that you weren't able to take at character creation. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, of course, would choose uh, the move that I have in there to uh, to have a, a friend or a companion. Uh, mm -hmm. It's called uh, Magical Backup. Uh, and so this would be like a love interest. And they would have your back. They would, the, it feels like the tuxedo mask sort of sort of character. Um, and I think that would be amazing. It's tuxedo mask and the Sailor Scouts and Cat Noir and pretty much any other character that is magical and marginally helpful. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And I love that these moves, they they add NPCs and, and other characters that you get to interact with or or even play uh, as, uh, you know, when in the case of your mon, you pass it off to somebody else and now, now they can play your your uh, your gator just however they want, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, that's fantastic. It's perfect. <laughs> Amazing. Well, is there anything else that we want to talk about? Uh, under the neighborhood before we wrap things up for this series? Uh, I don't think I can think of besides uh, shilling for folks who are interested. <laughs> Please right? where, do. where can we find it? Yeah. Yeah. So um, under the neighborhood right now, it's on drive through RPG and itch.io. Uh, eventually, I'll get it up other places. If you buy on itch, I'll make a community copy available. Um so someone can get it for free. But let's say you want to try the game first or you just you can't afford it right now and there aren't any community copies available. The thing I really wanted to highlight was, you know, I mentioned time and time again, oh, we have Quest Friends. It was made for Quest Friends. Listen to Quest Friends here after. It's what the it's what it was made for. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm running the game. So presumably it is being run as intended. Yes. <laughs> um, I would hope so. You would hope so. But uh, some I want to highlight is other games call them quick start rules. I do want to say that on our itch page, because I don't believe drive through allows external hyperlinks, but on our itch page, we have a downloadable free, what I call a demo version. The demo version is a completely rules have been stripped out. Like AP is not gone. It is. I don't even think I have the names of the moves. It is meant to be as simplified and streamlined as possible. It takes place in the world of hereafter, and it gives you pre-generated characters based on the cast of that game, as well as a pre-made adventure, which I actually used to test the system and make sure it works. So if you really want to just test out the world in a pre-generated setting with very light rules and with something that really focuses on the slice of life mechanic, which mm -hmm. is, I think, the big thing about this game that because of the fact that mm -hmm. we're a character creation podcast, we weren't able to explore. That is a great way to, to test it out. And with that in tow and seeing what it looks like with character creation here, you can get a better idea of is the full thing something I'd be interested in. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, well, Kyle, thank you so much for joining us to talk about Under the Neighborhood. This was fantastic. This was so much fun. This was such a great game. I'm so, like, I'm really excited that we got uh -huh. to talk about it. because I love Sky Hartford. It's... I want to be there. I know. Sky I don't think I want to live there, but I want to be there. Yeah. Our, our hearts are in Sky Hartford. <laughs> <laughs> but our bodies are here on Ground Hartford. Uh -huh. But Ground Hartford. Ground Hartford does have a pretty cool parade, so it's not yeah. all that bad. Uh -huh. Just don't relive Ground Hartford Day uh, over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, on that note. <laughs> oh, Kyle, uh, can you remind everyone where they can find you online and what sort of things you're working on? Yeah, you can find me online at questfriendspodcast.com, uh, where I am making the 
Quest Friends podcast, which is, again, an Under the Neighborhood podcast that Under the Neighborhood was designed for, where the worlds of the living and the dead are only a plane ride apart. Uh, we're currently dealing with a very large Necromon, which is our version of Mon, tournament where uh, Seto Kaiba, fantasy ghost Seto Kaiba, has plans and nobody knows what they are. Um, Incredible. It's such a good premise. Like, mm-hmm. it's just such a good premise. <laughs> but I'd encourage you to check check that out. It's 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 a fun show. It's what everything is designed for. As I said last episode, just one thing to keep in mind. While we do generally keep the tone and the jokes we have here, we do have cussing because we all cuss. and Because you're grown-ups. I didn't, well, yeah, I don't want to make people not do that. We cuss. We swear. Um, <laughs> Questfriendspodcast.com is where you're also going to find links to social media and other stuff I use. Uh, you can also check out Quest Friends on itch.io where you're going to find Under the Neighborhood. But next month, on August 1st, assuming all things go well, you will start seeing other games there. Ooh. And by that, I mean a, a free Kirby game called Dream Allies. Oh. I got I to gotta write it still, but I, it's August 1st is the day. It's the day it's happening. It has to be. Fantastic. My son would probably love that. He is obsessed with Kirby. I, I played Kirby in the Forgotten Land and fell so much in love that I was like, well, I'm going to make a one page RPG now. There you go. Yep. You're, you're all Kirby's friends hanging around and taking this adorable little creature on his mission to kill God. Oh, that's amazing. Um, but that's that's pretty much it. It's it's the one the one place or if you want to jump straight to our itch page for some of the games and stuff we make, you can jump there as well. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you again for sitting down with us. Uh, this was so much fun. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Call to watch action. Yeah, like that. I had a lot of fun with this game. Like yeah. this, this is a genre of television that I love. It's something mm-hmm. that like we're very engaged in at my house right now. Um, we have recently started listening to Quest Friends after doing this because mm-hmm. um, Nate wanted to know more about it and we're having fun with that one. Um, yeah, this is just like a fun. It, it's a cute game and it's just like happy. It's just nice. Yeah, it's just nice. It's very nice. Uh, e- even mechanically, I, I love the little additions to PBTA that were thrown in there. Yeah, uh, like, I, like the like GM intrusions and stuff that are happening, like from Cypher yeah. to this, I feel like um, fit really well with the theme that Absolutely. Kyle was going for. And I think that like he yeah. did a really great job making that happen. Yeah, and then the advanced playbook moves. Uh, like, I like love that. Those. I love That's that amazing. so much. It's genius yeah. because he's right that like after you pick those first couple, you've picked the ones you really wanted, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so being able to make those a little bit better, especially if you're playing a longer campaign too, you know, you get kind yeah. of bored doing the same thing over and over again. Yeah. So and then and then those uh those advanced uh advances for adding another descriptor even is yeah. just Goodness. Yeah. A lot of potential for long-term play. Yeah, I thought that was very cool. Very Absolutely. Cool. Before we let you go for the day, though, we have a few calls to action and some notes on what's coming up in your feeds in the next few weeks. First up, like we said at the beginning of the show, the Alchemistress's Kickstarter has a little over a week left, um, and it's approaching a stretch goal that will help with character creation. So that's mm-hmm. exciting. Um, yeah. If you enjoy the magical girl genre or just like feelings and romance and all of that kind of stuff, <laughs> uh-huh. uh, you definitely owe it to yourself to check out this game. It A- it really absolutely. is fantastic. So good. Uh, coming up in the next few weeks, we are extremely excited about we, what we have in store for you. Uh, and, th- and that's all starting tomorrow, July 19th. We are releasing a special spotlight episode to coincide with the launch of the itch funding campaign for Broken, a two player tragic romance RPG by previous guest on the show, Ben Wallace. Uh, this game is just so good. Uh, it hits you in the heart in all the right ways. Yeah, this is a uh, game that has like perfected bleed, honestly. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I've ever, I, I put it on Twitter too. I was like, I don't think I've ever had such a visceral reaction just reading a rule book. Yeah. Uh, it's so good. It's so good. It's so good. Um, and, and if everything works out before this episode releases, we'll probably have already recorded yeah. um, ourselves playing this game, uh, which will be uh, coming out in, on our Patreon relatively soon. Yeah, that's exciting. Hopefully we're yeah. recording this before the episode comes out. But by then, hopefully I will have been to Ryan's house. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's I'm so very exciting. We're going to see each other in the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> instead of living relatively adjacent it's, to one another. Yeah, only. instead of like only seeing each other at conventions in Ohio and uh -huh. Indiana and stuff. <laughs> It'll be exciting. <laughs> Pretty much. Absolutely. Uh, and absolutely check that episode out when it releases. Then coming July 26th, we have another spotlight recording for you that was just so good. We might have to split it up into two episodes that yeah. day. Um, we put them out on the same day, but it ended up being a lot longer of a recording than we meant to because we we're just having such a great time. Oh, it's so good. Uh, this one is for I Have the High Ground in celebration of its public release on that day. Mm -hmm. um, we were able to sit down with creators Jess Levine and the contributor Seda to create two phenomenal scenarios um, that we think you're, you'll really enjoy. Ryan and I got to lean fully into our nonsense harder than we probably <laughs> ever have before. The uh -huh. results were glorious. I loved the characters that Justin Seda made. It, I, uh -huh. it's, it's a game that can do a lot. Yeah. And I think can easily be slotted into a lot of other games. Um, and just, God, what a good time. What a good yeah, time. We, yeah. Uh, 100% check that out when it comes out because my goodness. Yeah. Finally, uh, uh, speaking of amazing games... Uh, in August, get ready for our next series, Nova, uh, a twice any nominated game uh, illuminated by Lumen. Uh, this was such a good recording with designer Spencer Campbell, and we are thrilled to showcase what that game has to offer as well. Yeah, I'm really excited. It's one that I've wanted to cover for a while, and we were waiting until all of my <laughs> any's judgments were officially in before yeah. I started recording with anybody. Um but yeah, congratulations on the, <laughs> the any nomination, Spencer. And I'm I'm really excited for people to hear this one. It was a great time. That's so good. Absolutely. If you want to hear any of these episodes sooner rather than later, you could always sign up for the side quest level or higher of our Patreon. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll get access to all of our episodes as soon as Ryan gets them edited and finalized. You'll also get any bonus episodes that we create, one of which we mentioned is coming soon. Um, as well as access to our patron-only channels in our Discord at discord.charactercreationcast.com. We've been having a lot of fun over there lately, too. Absolutely. Uh, and for those of us who are already supporting us through Patreon, uh, we'd like to thank you personally right now, uh, starting with Lieutenant, our very first patron. Uh, thank you again for your continued support. Eric Bonds, thank you as well for your support. David, a.k.a. Tigranosaurus, thank you. Matt Newton, thank you for your support. Daryl Holiday II, thank you. Shadim Cabal, thank you. Caleb, thank you so much. And it was actually really great chatting with you earlier this month. Yes, that was a lot of fun. I I'm looking forward to the next one. And also, thank you for letting us just say Caleb this time. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Benjamin Sweeney, thank you so much for your support, too. Mm -hmm. Lorcan McInnes, thank you. Rob Fletcher, thank you so much. And Kevin Brown, thank you for your support. And thank you to all of our future patrons. We are about a third of the way to covering our costs right now. So if you want to help us out directly, signing up for our Patreon is the best way to do that. You can sign up at patreon.com slash character creation cast and get a load of benefits right now. Absolutely. Uh, and finally, if you'd like to help us out in a way that doesn't cost a thing, feel free to leave a rating or review anywhere you are able to. Every five star review we get will read right here. In addition to leaving reviews, uh, you can also help us out tremendously by spreading the word about the show online or to your friends. Uh, we have a lot more planned for this year, so now is a fantastic time to dive into the show and join in the fun as it happens. 
that is all we have for today's episode. We'll be back tomorrow with a spotlight episode and again next week. So yeah. stay tuned for that. Uh, for now, enjoy the outtakes at the end. And as always, stay safe, drink some water, take care of yourselves. Maybe treat yourself to something nice. Uh, take some deep breaths and keep making those amazing people. We'll see you next time. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning or on my other podcast, Garbage of the Five Rings. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast it originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us, under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by the absolutely fantastic Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game system used and today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you'd like to support our show, find us on Patreon. Get access to bonus episodes, extra outtakes, and much, much more at patreon.com slash character creation cast. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows, like Design Doc. Join hosts Hannah Schaefer and Evan Rowland as they redesign their first role-playing game, Westlandia. Design Doc is an experiment in public participatory analog game design. It's fun, it's messy, and you're invited along for the ride. E Yay! Click. I, did it. I mean, clicked a couple of seconds right. ago, but I that, waited that's before. Good. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> I think I clicked like half a second too early because I usually account for the lag and I clicked right as I made the click sound. So Just too excited. <sighs> well, the nice thing is, unlike the claps, we won't all sit here in shame knowing that we didn't lie. Correct. Up. Right. Because that's why I stopped doing the claps is that it frustrated my cast like to uh -huh. no end. And we well, just like ended up lag and canceling. like, you know, did, like, did you start here or did you start here or did you do this? <laughs> this is my favorite when I do this and somehow like an idiot can't. <laughs> Only when it's, people are watching, though, like I can clap. I know how to clap. I swear. It's because you're watching yourself on video and not watching know, and your like, hands directly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no depth. Well, and perception. then like people do the like one, two, three, four, and I'm like, which number am I? Uh huh. I can't handle. It. I can't handle it. It's too much pressure. <laughs> too much pressure. So Ryan comes down and we click. Right. Yep. <laughs> I like it. And uh, I know the no cussing rule, mm -hmm. so if you hear me cuss, assume that that wasn't recorded because my audition stopped, and I will be followed up by me saying my audition stopped. Give me a second. <laughs> okay. Oh, no. But I have it up, so I'm watching it. I'm watching, like, my words move across the screen. Yeah. Let's, let's just hope it doesn't stop. <laughs> and stop, won't stop. Okay. Just stop, won't stop. Uh, I put my glasses here so I can read it. Stupid headphones, glasses combination. Um. <laughs> All right, and we can go ahead and stop our uh, recordings for this part. No. 
I did it. Me too. I did it. Less right. of a less of a leg between or more of a leg, I guess, between the start of clicky and the end of clicky this time. All right. We did it. We can stop the recording.